Ahem, I'm sorry to interrupt you two, but it's time for me to read this edition of the Walla Walla Gazette. I will be reading the November 30th, 1895 issue. The Social Whirl, The Masked Ball. A right jolly evening was what everybody experienced who attended the masked ball at Union Hall Wednesday evening, given under the auspices of the Tiger Engine Company No. 1. The number of maskers on the floor was equal to the accommodation of the room, while the chairs and benches were all occupied with interested spectators. When the masks were removed, prizes were bestowed as follows. Best Dressed Lady, Miss Anna Bender as Flower Girl. Prize, a Nutcracker Set. Best Sustained Lady Character, Miss Pearl Roth as Topsy. Prize, a Silver Napkin Ring. The Best Dressed Gentleman's Character, Mr. Zeno Strait as Captain John Smith. Prize, Individual Salt and Pepper Set. Best Sustained Gentleman's Character, John Lambert, as the Clown on Donkey Back. Prize, Silver Napkin Ring. The other maskers were as follows. Mr. Walter Hubert, Uncle Sam, Louis Kaminsky, Twins, Nick Sullivan, Twins, Joe Krauser, Prince, Earl Winchester, Blind Man, A. E. Kennedy, Dutchman, G. W. Kennedy, Foolish Boy, Frank Thrawn, Spanish Boy, Will Bowman as Hayseed, John Clary as Rosebud, C. Long as Fortune Teller, N. O. Patterson as Chambermaid, Mrs. Minnie Quinn as Fancy Costume, Pearl Petit as Butterfly, Augusta Truant as Little Red Riding Hood. Mary Hollister as Schoolgirl. The Thanksgiving Ball. One of the notable features of the Rebecca's Ball was the personnel of the company itself. Seldom is there seen a convocation of such well-chosen guests, especially where admittance is gained by money given at the door. But notwithstanding the fact that this order gives its entertainments for the purpose of replenishing its exchequer, it regulates the attendance by issuing invitations, and this is done very carefully. During the progress of the York, the entire floor was given up to Mr. and Mrs. C. C. McKay, and the whole assemblage paused to observe one of the finest exhibitions of the Terpsichorean art that Walla Walla eyes have ever looked upon. Convicts Escape Last Wednesday morning, about an hour before daylight, a convict by the name of G.T. Stevens, who was serving a 10-year sentence from Whatcom County, escaped from the penitentiary. Stevens was in the hospital, and by means of a fork and a stove lifter, which he managed to get into his possession, he made a hole through the wall of his womb, large enough to crawl through. 
Then, by making his way to a point in the wall covered by a dark shadow, he scaled the wall by means of a ladder that he had constructed from material found in his cell and bedroom. As it was so near day, his absence was soon discovered and guards were sent out to scour the surrounding country. After being at liberty for five hours, he was found about ten o'clock, only two miles distant, secreted under a bridge. James McManus, a convict sentenced from Spokane for one year, made his escape on the 19th, but the matter was kept quiet by the officials until Wednesday. McManus was a trustee employed in the dining room of Warden Musgrove. During the absence of the family on the evening of the 19th, he donned a new suit of clothes, the property of the warden, and walked to the city. He has not been heard of since. The Vienna Coffee House will serve hot chicken tamales today. They are made under the direction of Mrs. A. Ricardo, who learned the art in the city of Mexico. For a delicious ham or fine breakfast bacon, go to Beck and Brant's. Thoroughbred Poland China Hogs, imported and from imported stock. Large or small for sale at reasonable prices at my ranch. Address, Samuel Drumheller, Walla Walla Wash. That Pumpkin Pie In a downtown restaurant in Chicago, John Gilmore sat at his dinner. With a very discontented expression of countenance, he was jabbing with his fork a piece of pumpkin pie, which he had just ordered, seemingly determined that that particular piece should never know another victim. His thoughts ran something to this wise. Call that pumpkin pie a yellow skin over a piece of soggy dough? Then, through the association of ideas, his thoughts turned to that home in Ohio, where his mother, at this season of the year, always served daily the luscious pie rich as new milk, fresh eggs, and golden pumpkin could make it. I can't eat this. It's more than a human stomach can endure. I believe I will go back to Brookville and see the old place and dear old Aunt Sally. Next week is Thanksgiving and I can manage to get off two or three days. I'll never marry until I can find a woman who can make pumpkin pies as my mother could. With a final critical glance at the offending food, he took his hat and departed. That evening he wrote to his aunt, telling her of his intended visit, and in due time received a reply, so kind and cordial that it warmed his rather lonely heart and touched his conscience for not having gone before. Thanksgiving morning, John Gilmore was awakened by the unwanted sound of crowing cocks and lowing cows. For a few moments he was dazed. Then he remembered that the night before he had reached Brookville. Thanksgiving Day finally arrived. Aunt Sally had invited all the neighbors. The dinner was a brave affair. The guests, some 20 or 30, sat at one long table, graced with turkey, of course, cranberry sauce, potatoes, half a dozen kinds of vegetables, scads of plummy celery, luscious jelly preserves, and cakes. In fact, all the prodigal profusion of a country Thanksgiving dinner. Aunt Sally had introduced John to a very nice-looking neighbor named Ruth Gray. Ruth was now passing out what John thought was the crowning glory of the whole feast, pumpkin pies. Ruth, with her two young friends, waited on them all, handing the coffee, heaping the plates, and cutting the pie. This last operation John watched with interest, for pumpkin pie cannot be cut properly by a careless hand. Ruth cut it with two quick strokes, leaving a clean edge of delicious custard and an unbroken crust. After the repast, John, whose reserve had thawed under the influence of the good things of which he had partaken, said to the lady next to him, 
Mrs. Gray. You must let me thank you for that delicious pumpkin pie. It was as good as my mother's, and that is the highest praise I can bestow. Mrs. Gray looked pleased and said, I'm glad you like it. Ruth made it. She was up at five o'clock, so to have all of them fresh. She says if there's anything detestable, it is a pumpkin pie with a crust soaked till it is soggy. Before the frost was on the pumpkin the next year, Ruth was mistress of a cozy flat in Chicago and John the head of that same establishment. If you enjoyed hearing today's stories from the Walla Walla Gazette, you can subscribe to my channel. It's easy! Just click here to subscribe.